mobile internet connection is also good or not. Oh, okay. Um, so we are already live, Diane. Um, so it's, uh, it's a, a, a wonderful pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Um, it's, it's good and, to be here. And, um, and so, uh, uh, welcome. Uh, I'm going to say just a few uh, words in Portuguese. Uh, Bem-vindos a mais um seminário de cultura material e da história da ciência, organizado pelo Museu de História Natural uh, e da Ciência da Universidade de Lisboa. Uh, o meu nome é Catarina Madruga e estou hoje um, a moderar e a apresentar uh, um colega uh, e um grande amigo, temos algumas, alguns trabalhos em comum, um, que uh, vou passar a apresentar em inglês. Todo o seminário vai decorrer pela primeira vez deste, desta série online em inglês, mas espero que consigam acompanhar e uh, todas as perguntas que tenham uh, podem colocá-las no chat uh, a partir da altura que tiverem, eu vou acompanhando e depois no final uh, da apresentação podemos então apanhar as perguntas e os comentários de todos uh, e não se, não se coibam de colocar perguntas ou comentários também em português, não há problema nenhum. Uh, podemos depois traduzir. Um, so it is uh, so welcome, Dejan. Um, uh, Dr. Dejan Lukic is a Serbian historian, a historian, and um, his PhD uh, two years ago, uh, uh, defended two years ago, was entitled "A Strong Class of Serious Scholars: The Power Dynamics of Knowledge Production in the Earth Sciences in Serbia Between 1880 and 1914." Um, and so uh, I've uh, accompanied uh, Dejan's work with much pleasure um, and it's, um, it's really irrelevant for us here to have in the seminar also a point of view from uh, a different case study that I've, I think we've probably never heard in this seminar series uh, from the other side of Europe uh, in, in regards to Portugal um, and how collecting uh, but also the creation of the professions of earth science related to earth sciences were important to a new elite, a new uh, bourgeois and liberal elite in the between the final uh, stages of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so with this in mind, uh, welcome again, Diane. Uh, thank you for um, having uh, being here with us today and um, the floor is yours whenever you want to start. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this honor to present at the seminar. Uh, I'm truly grateful and I'm hope that uh, this will be an interesting lecture for the audience that I assume would be mostly Portuguese. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're dealing with European peripheries and, and I'm trying to present the case for the science on European peripheries on something that uh, May from the the how to say the the, the focus of interest of the, of this of the of the uh, history of science that is focused on the centers may may show some interesting cases of how science works on the peripheries and how scholars on the peripheries work and think and how their activities uh, actually demonstrate some things about uh, social and political aspects of science and its. Uh, and, and its embeddedness in, in ver various social and political structures. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna share now the, my presentation with you. So uh, thank you, thank you for, uh, first for reminding me, I kind of like completely forgot uh, at the beginning uh, my own thesis title, the strong class of serious scholars, uh, which was a quotation from uh, from the speech of uh, my uh, my key actor in in, in this uh, in, in my research, Jovan Jurić, who at some point stressed that he wants to create a strong class of serious scholars, and I kind of amused myself with this statement when I was writing my my thesis, and I kind of revolved my narrative about, about demonstrating his attempt to create scholars as, as, as a social class and, and to establish them recognized in the society, which was considerably difficult. But this lecture will be focused more on, uh, on, on the process of, of, of collecting and how he was trying to uh, form 
a network where he would be able to collect specimens. He needed a network uh, of collaborators. And generally, in order to form a collect geological collection in the 19th century Serbia, he needed to surpass many obstacles and persuade people that what he was doing was actually very significant. Um, I will start first with very general uh, uh, general introduction on, 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 the, on the practices of collection, collecting and how science was actually related and dependent on the practices of collecting. I trust that people who are uh, into museology and the history of science know a lot about this. Uh, Harold J. Cook and Daniel Margucci uh, gave a very valuable contribution to their work on uh, on, on the Dutch, for example, practices of collecting during the 17th century. And uh, they put a lot of emphasis on the, the social and commercial elements of, of these practices. In just in short, that uh, these practices of collecting was a con were, were a consequence of geographical discoveries and search of new goods coming from, uh, from the worlds that Europeans discovered uh, outside the world, the worlds that will eventually become colonies. And uh, these objects become curiosities for the European upper class. And uh, these uh, upper class people became interested in gathering them and, and the trade in these items became highly, highly uh, popular and influential and influenced stabilization of certain practices of collecting, which ultimately uh, to an extent uh, uh, influence uh, formation of certain scientific practices. Why am I stressing this like uh, like three centuries before uh, my story starts and, and in a completely different context? It's because I really want to sh uh, stress how different the situation was and how the origins of the practices originated in specific social, uh, social sociopolitical context that was considerably different than uh, than it was in Serbia in the late 19th century. So who were the people who, who brought these uh, first uh, items to Europe? They're usually European travelers, members of the colonial administration. And uh, the recent studies in the last couple of dec decades stressed the importance of the local knowledge production systems and how uh, a local emulation, appropriation, and adaptation of collecting practices transformed the science and that actually this was not one directional process that Europeans simply collected the items and brought them to Europe, but that actually uh, the, the local people, uh, whatever we could talk about indigenous people or various local scholarly, uh, how to say, intellectual, intellectual and elite circles participating in this process informed Europeans and to an extent transformed, uh, uh, transformed these practices. Kapil Raj, for example, talks about circulation of knowledge rather than transfer so that generally uh, generally, this this kind of like so-called periphery did have a very active role in these in these pra practices. I'm going to run through this uh, section too a bit quickly. So, generally, in global science, uh, these practices of collecting became stabilized in the 18th and the 19th century uh, through the Republic of Letters and the cabinets of curiosities. Uh, by the 19th century, we have already stabilized institutions as as uh, scholarly institutes and the museums. So in the 19th century, museums were uh, uh, key places for the production of scientific knowledge. They were uh, extremely important. And practically, these were the places where all these collected items were exhibited, studied, uh, uh, and represented. And they, they became accessible to the public, which actually contributed to, to a public representation of science. Uh, and. Uh, and from this on, like I would like to stress that these practices in the 19th century starts, they start being trans, uh, how to say, not transplanted as much as emulated in other parts of Europe. Serbia was one of those, and that uh, that uh, that uh, local scholars uh, like those in Serbia try to emulate these uh, these scientific practices. They want to become the part of the world. They want to be recognized internationally. And they want to say that they have some kind of something to show and something to demonstrate. And this is where there where actually I would like to one of the points that I would like to stress in uh, um, in my studies is that 
uh, for Serbian scholars, particularly for Jovan Jovic, the, the, how to say, the first geologist who actually mobilized everything, gathering specimens was a way uh, to demonstrate the values of Serbian science. He wanted to establish Serbian uh, scholarship as something that can contribute by collecting, gathering, mapping, and uh, giving, uh, giving these kind of specimens to the world science as a place where reliable information, reliable items could be collected and then sent to the rest of the Europe to various European centers that demonstrate that Serbian scholars can rightfully and capably collect uh, and identify and study uh, local, local, uh, local, um, local items, local specimens, and that uh, this could be valuable, recognized uh, abroad. Uh, so I, I would now slow down and just provide a bit of a context. So, so what was happening in Serbia in the 19th century? This was an Ottoman province that gained autonomy in the 1830s and didn't have uh, full independence in 19, until 1878. Um, uh, generally, this the, this Ottoman province uh, was a country of peasants. Uh, they didn't have a developed intellectual elite at the beginning, so practically, uh, building of the of the the, the process of state building uh, involved a lot of uh, how to say trying to get rid of the Ottoman heritage. They were embarrassed of their Ottoman past, and at the same time, they were very actively engaged in adapting and transplanting uh, intellectual practices of Western Europe. Like they intentionally tried to erase uh, all the Ottoman past and then they try strive to becoming a Western European nation. Uh, because of the large number of the Serbian population in the, the Austria-Hungary, a lot of uh, ethnic Serbs from the Habsburg Empire came to Serbia and they came, became practically the leaders uh, of the of, of the Serbian administrative, political, social, intellectual elite, and uh, they uh, guided through this process of emula emulation of various institute European institutions. They uh, they guided the development of this process to to various stages of various institutional building, and one of the key elements of this state building and nation building was education. Uh, formation of state required education. That there was a lot of emphasis on building education. However, in these first initial decades between uh, the 1830s and the 1870s, uh, there was too much emphasis on the building uh, an educational system that will be focused on providing state administration. Initially, uh, what people were educated were sent sent abroad to be educated in mm -hmm. uh, in medicine. So uh, a lot of physicians were uh, were were taught at the time because they mm -hmm. needed physicians. They needed military officers. So a lot of uh, people were sent to study uh, ver to very military various military schools uh, across Europe. And finally, they needed lawyers. So practically, uh, up until the 1870s, the, the emphasis of the of the educational system was solely on producing uh, producing physicians, military officers, and lawyers. And I'm stressing this in order to put it in the contrast that there was very little space for science. Uh, that uh, the educational programs were developed in a way that they strive towards providing science, but uh, uh, natural sciences had very small number of students, and in some periods, uh, the numbers were actually over the years decreasing because there was no there was no seen practicality in something like that. So, so, so in the, in this way, like, there was really no uh, no full recognition that state actually needs science. Now, one of the things was like in when it comes to collecting rocks and then the fully legitimate question in the 19th century uh, survey was why would anyone want to collect rocks? Why, do, why does <laughs> Serbian society need specimens? Like why would mm -hmm. this be necessary? And what kind of specimens would be needed? And like the thing was like, there was really no, uh, and, it, and I'm saying this in, in, in a full, uh, in, in historical context, they really saw no point in doing that. 
-hmm. However, there was an aware, uh, awareness that some economic benefits may come out of it because uh, once the Ottomans left, for example, all, all the uh, skilled and educated miners that were uh, living and working at the territory of Serbia at the time were usually Ottoman citizens. And with the growing independence and autonomy of Serbia, uh, all the Ottoman uh, miners practically left and at, in, the, during, in this, this particular period between 1830s and uh, after 1830s, practically they had no qualified miners who would be doing any mining activities in the country. And, uh, and this kind of awareness that for economic benefit, somebody should do the survey and, and provide information on how Serbia could, uh, how Serbia could uh, start mining on, on its own territory. And in 1835, uh, Baron Sigismund uh, Amadeus Wolfgang Herder, uh, the last name should sound familiar because he is son of Gottfried Herder, the philosopher. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, so this uh, his um, uh, he was hired by the Serbian principality to conduct a, a field survey and investigate the possibilities for uh, for mining. I'm mentioning this just for the sake to sh uh, because he conducted a survey in 1835 and he wrote the report that uh, the principality, the prince, uh, prince of Serbia uh, requested from him. And that report uh, was sitting in a drawer for 10 years. Nobody looked at it because there was nobody qualified in the country to actually read that report and do something about it. Mm -hmm. So up until the 1845, there was no qualified person to actually read it. And one of the Serbian scholars who studied, uh, uh, studied uh, mining in, 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 in Chemnitz, uh, this is Banska Stjavnica in Slovakia nowadays, yeah. uh, uh, he, um, he, uh, he read this report and translated in Serbia and in, into Serbian. And what I would like really to stress here, like it was the way he translated it because it was uh, not a translation, but more a description on what was inside that he, he uh, transport, translated and reported only on those parts that were economically viable, while Herder, uh, Baron Herder uh, uh, did a considerably good job in describing the, in all the areas that he visited uh, uh, in the translation anything that was not economically viable was omitted. For example, if he was describing in an area that was a sandstone, for example, in translation that didn't exist. So only those, uh, all, all those possibilities that something could be mined like coal, certain ores, certain uh, marble, for example, that would be used for ornaments or for example, salt uh, and mineral waters. Those were mentioned in the translation. So this kind of speaks that at the time, like the first thing that they saw was economic interest. And outside of that, uh, they didn't see, see much interest. Uh, while this was happening, Austrian Hungarian scholars were passing through the country uh, uh, during a period of several decades, gathering specimens and transferring everything to Vienna and Budapest. And uh, there was not much interest actually in the principality itself to you know, n observe anything. They were fully aware that some Austrians and Hungarians are passing through. There was not too much, many of them. But generally, uh, uh, they didn't pay that much attention to the activities of these scholars. Uh, I'm just mentioning to just briefly uh, the journey of Ami Bouet and mm -hmm. August Kenel, who did a big expedition in the Balkans between 1836 and the 1838. Uh, unlike Herder, they were actually having, having much bigger interest. They, they wanted to cover the entire Balkan Peninsula. And uh, they were doing the research together at some point. Then they split. They came together back. And they came with a lot of data, a lot of specimens. And uh, up until the 1890s, uh, their study was the, 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 how to say, the basis of all, uh, all the works on the Balkan Peninsula. It was so crucial uh -huh. that it was cited as the most relevant work even in the 1890s. For example, it was translated into Serbian for the first time in the 1890s. And it was considered the work, the ultimate uh, um, the work that, that actually gave information about both geography and geology uh, mm -hmm. of the Balkan Peninsula, and this included Serbia, and this was the ultimate study that, that was done at the moment. Uh, there were other scholars 
that uh, that uh, were venturing through Serbia uh, until the 1890s. And I'm showing these maps just to demonstrate some of these passages. Franz Tula was, for example, highly important. He was do doing continued surveys during the 1880s. But because yeah. at some point he was forbidden from passing through Serbia, for example, he mostly did his research in Bulgaria. But nevertheless, he also, um, uh, by accident, for example, he investigated some of the areas that uh, later Serbia acquired, so he became relevant uh, uh, as well. Ferdinand von Hochstetter, for example, who was an, uh, another scholar. So Austrians generally uh, mm -hmm. passed through Serbia, they conducted uh, some kind of surveys, and generally this established at the time Vienna as the center uh, I would say center of calculation that assembled all the information about the Balkan Peninsula and all the Serbian scholars knew that if they need information about this, they need to talk with Austrians and that Austrians possess everything that, that uh, ev uh, Austrians possess everything that is about Serbia and they have to rely on that work. So while Austrians were collecting and gathering various specimens in Serbia, what was happening at the same time with, with, in, with, the, with Serbian scholars, what the intellectuals were actually doing. Uh, uh, I will first mention collections that are completely lost and that are recorded only notes as that they, they existed. Uh, we know that uh, somewhere in the 1830s, uh, state officials assigned a uh, state military hospital uh, to gather all the rock specimens from the country. So military physicians were assigned officially that they should maintain a, a collection of rocks. Uh, this is the only information that we have about it, that mm -hmm. this collection existed and that physicians were the ones who were supposed to take care of it. Uh, most of it, uh, of it is known uh, because there was a, th there was a preserved report uh, uh, when this collection was transferred, transferred in 1854 uh, when Josip Pančić uh, took over the collection. Now, Josip Pančić in itself is a very interesting figure, but uh, for this story, uh, I would say like, I'm not gonna spend too much time. He was a Croatian physician who in 1853 became the professor uh, of natural history mm -hmm. in the Belgrade Lyceum. Mm -hmm. At the time, Belgrade Lyceum was the highest educational institution. And uh, as a someone who was, Okay, you got frozen there for a bit. Okay, slowly we'll get uh, to hear you properly. Um, okay, I think so. Do you want to start uh, again from uh, he moved to the Belgrade Lyceum? Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, so uh, Josip Pančić, uh, he was a, a natural physician, a physician who was a, uh, he was a botanist. Uh, he, uh, his entire scientific career was developed around botany because he was teaching uh, natural history. He was responsible mm -hmm. also for geological collection. And so he started teaching, um, he started teaching on uh, natural, uh, natural history in 1853. And in 1854, uh, the Ministry of Education decides that all the, uh, all the rock collections, all the rock specimens should be transferred to the Lyceum under mm -hmm. his, and to be under his jurisdiction. Uh, so we knew that uh, everything that was in the military hospital ended at, uh, in, in Panchit's hand. But what, uh, from this transfer, what we learned also that Ministry of Education uh, transferred some of the specimens they themselves had in their own collection. Now, this is the only mentioning that the Ministry of Education had some kind of collection of rocks. It's a completely unknown origin, unknown who was maintaining it, what was in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, Dan, we lost you again for a bit. Just 
connection. Yeah, I'm sorry. The connection is, is maybe now not so good at the moment. Yeah, okay. Good. Go ahead. Okay. This, this is better? Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's hope it's not going to enter. Yeah, let's see if without the camera, it, it works a little um, bit better. So, so uh, yeah. Okay, so um, at the same time when the collection at the hospital and the ministry were, uh, existed, uh, they, we know for certain that Department of Mining of the Ministry of Economy also had its own collection of specimens, but mm -hmm. uh, there's very little known about it because miners uh, didn't publish their results. There was no public uh, announcements of what they actually find. Mm -hmm. They didn't present their collections in the museum and they were not at the time still in in teaching. So teaching geology started only uh, somewhere uh, uh, after 1910. So like there was absolutely no studies of even mining uh, uh, in Serbia at the time. So like these collections remain solely for commercial uh, commercial purposes and uh, there was no systematic processing of that would result in any form of scientific publications. However, what Pancic managed to secure is that the Department of Mining transfer uh, some of the specimens they find uh, back to the school. However, uh, naturally this, uh, these uh, specimens that, uh, uh, that were transferred from the Department of Mining were of a very specific type that were usually uh, related to commercial ores or technical ores. Um, mm -hmm. When you're on Jewevich, the, uh, the main character of this story uh, becomes the professor of natural of sciences, uh, of ge geology and uh, uh, geology and mineralogy. Uh, Pancic persuaded him to study uh, earth sciences in Paris and upon his arrival, Pancic gave him uh, practically put to take the chair uh, in geology. What we know, for example, today about these previous collection, he does the official, first official review of what actually existed from these collections in the okay. country. Um, so, so what he found was that the previous collections were not systematically collected, the inventories did not correspond to actual specimens, and he tried to establish a new organization. Uh, to give an example of how, how, what was the situation, he was mentioning that, uh, for example, he found a lot of specimens uh, uh, in the collection that didn't exist in the inventory, and then Pancic mm -hmm. was actually sh showing him that, for example, th these specimens belong to the original hospital collection. For example, mm -hmm. that Pancic knew this, but in the inventory, it was not registered. Mm -hmm. So Shrevich tries to, to set up some kind of an organization and, and, and he divides the collection in three different groups. And uh, first thing that I would really like to stress is that he separates a teaching collection, collection that he would use in his classes. And mm -hmm. he's really, he really picks there what he's gonna do with this. Uh, he picks a collection that would be useful for teaching. Then mm -hmm. he devised a Serbian collection that, uh, that um, so uh, items that came from Serbia and a collection of foreign items, those that were brought from abroad. And what is most interesting here is that the foreign collections were several times uh, uh, larger than the Serbian collection. Uh, foreign collection had around 2000 items while uh, the Serbian collection was around 400. So this was very interesting to me that uh, that foreign collection was considerably bigger than the one mm -hmm. that of items than the one that were actually from Serbia. Mm -hmm. uh, the foreign collection was even more interesting when you look at the origins of uh, where most of the items came from. They were either from uh, the region of Banat, right north from Serbia. They were either from uh, from Slovakia, present day mm -hmm. Slovakia, or from Saxony, which actually in both cases responded to the Freiburg and Chemnitz mining schools where most of the miners okay. came from. So, so they came and brought these specimens. It's kind okay. of, and considering that most scholars that pass through, for example, 
uh, the, uh, the, the Hungarian geologist Sabo, for example, he was studying Banat and for his studies of Banat, he's crossed to Serbia to actually check. So my guess would be that Sabo with him brought some of the specimens to Banat to Serbia as well. So uh, judging from the geographical location of where these yeah. uh, specimens came from, we can actually think, uh, thought about mm -hmm. who actually brought them. Um, so Jurovic essentially became, I'm, I'm gonna just be, he was practically the founder of geology. He was the teacher at the, uh, the Grand Lyceum, uh, Lyceum transformed into the Grand School later into the university. Uh, he was a member of chief educational committees in the country, uh, creator of the, the Department of the Mineralogy and Geology, creator of the Institute, and he practically taught the first generation of earth scientists and consequently um, everything starts from him. So saying that he was founder would really not be an exaggeration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what I'm going to focus how much time I have, it's already half, uh, half an yeah. hour past. You can take another five or 10 minutes, it's up to you. Yeah, okay. So what one of the things that uh, was the issue of how to find collaborators, because mm -hmm. otherwise he would have to rely solely on the items that he found himself. Uh, so who were available. So uh, generally mining engineers and sc uh, school teachers were those who were available, who had some knowledge and some skills to gather. Uh, mining engineers had their own systems. They were trans traversing, traversing the country. Uh, uh, mining excavations were a place mm -hmm. where naturally a large number of uh, rocks were dug out and then uh, investigated. On the other side, the distribution of schools ac uh, across the country as was uh, um, an already existing network where people who were trained to identify uh, rocks uh, worked and, and was actually capable of investigating the surroundings. The only issue was how to actually persuade these people to, to go and do these kind of studies. Mm -hmm. um, the Department of Mining and Miners generally were not that collaborative, but the Ministry of Education had the network of schools and mm -hmm. kind of like put a pressure on DEV uh, to do something about it. And in 1880, uh, Ministry of Education is, uh, had an initiative to establish a rock collection for teaching in the high schools. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they asked uh, first the Department of Mining to provide the samples, uh, but the department uh, refused to cooperate. Uh, they, they ignored this request for fully two years and in 1882, uh, the mine, Department of Mining uh, finally responded and said they cannot allocate anyone to help the Ministry of Education to provide rock collections for teaching in schools. And they redirected them to Zhuevich to grant school and said that you know, Zhuevich should, should help them. Uh, Zhuevich accepted uh, this order and decided to participate in the process. So they made an, an arrangement in which uh, the local schools all across the country were supposed to organize collecting of the rocks Mm -hmm. and then to ship these uh, rock specimens to Belgrade with the help of the Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. They either used uh, the railway that was, there was one line existing at the time, or they used local authorities, uh, so local munis municipal uh, clerks, uh, which it, in that case, in practice meant police, to transport mm -hmm. the boxes to Belgrade. Uh, very small number of, of schools replied. Actually, in number, it was exactly 10. Mm -hmm. And most of them were not providing uh, proper information for their collection. For example, most of the samples uh, didn't have any information about the lo locations mm -hmm. where they were collected. Uh, the majority of specimens were useless, either damaged or too small. And uh, he complained that practically most of what came was not use useful. And uh, because of the lack of first lack of response and lack of uh, finding of the proper uh, pro pro proper specimens, he was imploring the Ministry of Education to put more pressure on school to respond. But uh, eventually, the Ministry of Education itself lost interest, so the whole project failed. Yeah. However, uh, uh, even though this project failed. Uh, this was actually the basis from the establishment of his own network of collaborators because those schools, those, te those 10 schools who did reply, 
mm -hmm. actually became his, his own personal collaborators in the forthcoming two decades. And uh, they continue to send specimens uh, in the same way that was established uh, uh, during this failed project. So they mm -hmm. used, for example, local authorities to ship, uh, for example, um, crates and boxes uh, of rocks to, to Belgrade so that he could identify them. Um, so these kind of first met, uh, so the net for the school is themselves. Uh, this uh, put an influence on teachers to do their own research, but also on, on uh, high school students to do surveys in their own surroundings and gather specimens according to the way they were taught to do. Uh, what was significant in this was that while the significance of rock collecting was fully ignored and was not recognized in the society at the time, this project actually uh, managed to persuade a number of people that yeah. uh, rock specimens was important because it was useful for education. So uh, economic interest was not that uh, important uh, class elements in the society and mm -hmm. collecting specimens as something that would be a matter of class prestige didn't exist. But what was recognized as, as a useful thing was, uh, was the, the conviction that this is necessary for education, for the children to learn and for the society in advance in this kind of educational way. Um, Ultimately, uh, this, this network was building, and I would have to stress, it was not only school teachers and, and students that, that collaborated uh, uh, in his own, I should be finishing soon just to stress, like finally, who actually did collaborate was mining engineers, school teachers, uh, professors at the grad, grad school, for example, uh, his own colleagues who were of very diver diverse education, architects, Ar architects, mathematicians, physicists, um, even um, uh, uh, teachers who taught art because they knew that you need these kind of samples mm -hmm. when they were traveling to the country, they were bringing them something. Students who him taught like naturally were the ones who like during summer recess, he would give them assignments to collect uh, whatever they can in their own home environments. And, uh, but also like what uh, became quite peculiar that, for example, railway station managers appear uh, as, uh, as, as contributors uh, because Zhuvich himself was traveling around the country. Uh, uh, occasionally, he would drop a crate full of rocks on, mm -hmm. on the railway station, and the railway station manager, who was supposed to ship them, eventually uh, decided to assemble their own collection and, and you know, send uh, send, send a shipment to Jurovic because he thought Jurovic might need something like that. Uh, finally, uh, members of the royal family, uh, but this was more of a, uh, like these were donations as that, as, as the, the supreme authorities of the countries, they wanted to show themselves as contributors to science. So they were donating uh, 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 shipments, uh, 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 samples as well. And uh, diplomats, various scholars, for, uh, various scholars who were appointed as diplomats in the countries and the vicinity, they were sending uh, specimens to Zhuvich for uh, identification. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, eventually, these collections were used for teaching. Uh, Zhuvich managed to exploit a large number of specimens he was uh, receiving for international uh, exchange. Uh, meteorites were highly profitable. For example, he managed to exchange these specimens for various uh, instruments, books, journals, other specimens. Uh, unfortunately, at the beginning, uh, most of the analysis had to be done abroad. So in the first couple of decades, he had problem problems because he didn't have adequate laboratories, for example, to, to examine minerals. But once that mm -hmm. was improved, for example, they, they were capable of doing the research themselves. So uh, generally this story in the conclusion, I would just like to stress on how the establishment of scientific practices actually uh, was dependent on, on already existing power networks and hierarchies and that uh, the transfer of knowledge, uh, transfer of knowledge from one place to another actually depends on the local power structures and that in the process of this kind of adaptation and appropriation of 
uh, of science, there is some kind of a process of adaptation to the local mm -hmm. um, environment and local power structures. And that in this particular case, uh, Jurovich, in order to establish collections, had to rely heavily on the Ministry of Education, mm -hmm. on the networks of schools, on the networks of, uh, for example, local uh, municipal clerks, police, mm -hmm. who were actually, uh, in one way or another, became participants in this process of collecting, even though they were not experts and didn't have uh, um, proper qualification. Um, and uh, essentially uh, by assembling these collections, which were locally very uh, limited to very local Serbian collections, he tried to, uh, through exchange and se by sending these specimens to Vienna, Berlin and, and, and other uh, scholarly centers, he tried to show uh, how Serbian scholars can uh, contribute on their own uh, in this scientific production. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess I um, should end here. Yeah, thank you so much, Diane. This was um, uh, a brilliant um, overview and uh, of of your uh, PhD, but of of also your your extensive work and in depth work. And um, I will um, maybe, uh, you can turn on your, uh, video now and I'll do the same thing. Should I stop uh, sharing? Um, yeah, just so that people can look at our ugly faces. Okay. Um, so yeah, so just p p taking on to this, uh, really crucial, um, uh, point of your thesis, which is about these, um, experts and non-experts, um, network. Yeah of collaborations. Uh, we have a question from Teodora and she asks uh, specifically whether the collaborators that were military physicians, whether they were trained in Austrian military academies, because we know that uh, ever since the late 18th century, um, these were where, where people were trained to, uh, you know, acknowledge this importance of mining and, and have all these uh, practical knowledge uh, 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 of these natural resources. Yes. So was that the um, case? Um, yes, to an extent. Uh, so when it comes to on the first time uh, medical education, most of the physicians, to my knowledge, were educated either in Aust Austrian Hungarian schools or in German schools. Mm -hmm. However, when it comes to military education, this and this is like quite contrast. Most of the military officers were trained in Russia. Uh, so when it comes to military physicians, uh, my assumption is that one part of these military physicians was definitely trained in Russia, but because uh, when it comes to medicine uh, at the time, there was much more emphasis on, on German and Austrian medical schools. So, uh, so like, I, I really don't know their names and their identities, but uh, just merely in, uh, following mm -hmm. the statistic statistically, where people went to study what uh, most of these uh, like in the first couple of decades most students went to Vienna and Berlin uh, 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 Munich was actually uh, actually also one of the locations so uh, consequently uh, the the places of education were the the places where uh, most of the the most of the scholars did get training uh, um, uh, uh, who, who are doing air sciences? With, so the same places where where actually all the all the all the people who were engaged in in, in uh, earth sciences did get trained at mm -hmm. the time. So like when it comes to locality, this was was exactly this where these were exactly the same places. Yeah. So uh, amazing. So that that brings us to the point uh, that I uh, I think we can also make about um, not just uh, how uh, network works uh, networks work but also the point that you can uh, see, then that you showed it here now uh, so elegantly, that you can see also from the collection and from the material physicality of the collection itself, uh, what was important and, and actually where maybe these collaborators, these miners were taught um, because they were, uh, there's, there's, sorry, I'm, jambling two questions, two different questions. My first question would be, uh, or a comment would be then, uh, do you see a long durée in this story or can you really compartmentalize it between 
um, maybe first this uh, earlier period with Pancic, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and then yeah. Juzovic as sort of like a, a, a sort of a, a new bre breathing air to the to the discipline. If you can, if if you would um, categorize it into periods, like very distinctly, or if it has to do with also the political sphere and the political and the public uh, sphere uh, in in Serbia, um, yeah. or whether you'll see sort of an overarching. Uh, evolutionary step ladder to to how the discipline of, of geology and the earth sciences developed yeah. in Serbia. Uh, yeah, uh, a very good question. Like um, like when you said long durée, I was like, is there a long durée there really? Um, I wouldn't say that it's a long durée. Like, and the thing is, was like one of the the, the key issues. Like, I, I guess in history, when you're studying something like that, is like this notion of continuity and discontinuity. Yeah. And, and, and whether, for example, appearance of, appearance of uh, person, I, persons like Pancic and Shurevich actually considered certain breaks in history or not. Um, I would say like, if I would have to characterize this process of, um, I, I, I love the word emulation because hmm. they were not, like it's more emulation of, of practices than the transfer because they try to imitate, but they are fully aware that they have uh, considerably limited uh, uh, abilities to do it because of material resources. It's not that much uh, related that much to, to knowledge, but the more of like what kind of resources are available at the moment. And because the, uh, well, you're breaking up now. Uh, so you're um, breaking up a little bit. Um, sorry. Do you? Yeah. yeah, sorry. So do you want to go back a little bit? Because we, yeah, okay. we lost you for a couple of seconds. Yeah, I noticed your face was frozen and I realized that I was. <laughs> okay. So One I'm of us just going to. Frozen, I don't know. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, okay. I'm just going to get uh, go back a bit. So just uh, I see mostly this development as haphazard. Mm -hmm. And that uh, uh, that mostly dependent on on some kind of ad hoc development and ad hoc circumstances that determined uh, the, the the amount of emulation that they were capable of doing. Uh, for example, I things that thing that I didn't talk about, which I actually spent a lot of things in my thesis, was uh, the 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 effort to, to translate books. And this was interesting that this translation of books was actually mostly at random, like the selection of books they translated into Serbia to poor education was actually really random uh, selection of books, like books that uh, from the historical perspective were probably not that important, but this random translations of books were actually setting the standards and the practices. Uh, there is one really common trope in the Serbian uh, history that's debating about modernization and that mm -hmm. uh, puts an emphasis on how uh, once uh, Maria Todorova, uh, when she was doing the case generally for Balkan and uh, Bulgaria, actually brings uh, in her imaginary Balkan section, brings one, some of the issues uh, as well that once the, how to say, the, country, uh, the, the non Western countries try to catch up with the West. Mm -hmm. and emulate certain practices, they do not emulate something that is old, something that is several decades old, to try to pick up the most recent things. And for this reasons, once the, the Serbian scholars in the same way, when they try to emulate these practices, they're not gonna uh, use the theories and the works that are too old, they were gonna try to catch up with the most recent ones. Mm -hmm. But uh, mostly because of the lack of resources, for example, translating books or acquiring some specimens, mm -hmm. uh, what they're gonna pick up will be whatever is at the moment they identify mm -hmm. as either available or most significant, and they're gonna try to pick up on this. So in the case of the, the Serbian sense, they were fully aware that Vienna was the place where everything was happening. And they were highly frustrated that if they have a collection of minerals, they have to send it to Vienna, and uh, and mm -hmm. uh, like and then wait for the Viennese, uh, um, you know, geologists whenever they find time to identify that and send them back. And for example, in the personal notes in the diaries of Jewish, I find you know notes that Austrians still haven't returned collection this and this because. And they like, you know, they completely pretend that they never got it or something yeah. like and he's suspicious that they deliberately did that. 
And, uh, but at the same time, they, they have to rely on this and they have to communicate with them, with, to collaborate with them, and they show them that they're fully capable of producing. Of course, they're fully aware that they cannot do all these things, mm. that they don't have resources. And uh, like there, there were many debates related to the Indian knowledge because uh, there is a growing sense of inferiority among Serbian mm-hmm. geologists. They're fully aware that, oh, we cannot do this or that. And they, they, they constantly str- struggle with this kind of feeling. So when you talk about long durée, I think that these kind of like developments is a set of long, uh, how to say, haphazard mm-hmm. disruptions in the intellectual practices that uh, make, uh, how to say, random jumps that uh, mm-hmm. uh, eventually uh, uh, result in the production of, of some kind of a system that uh, tries to emulate, but at the same time produce its own uh, how to say, produce its own science. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, you, you've also spoken about uh, how uh, after 1910, then you do get uh, geology as a, a teach, yeah. a teach or a, a, as a training well, discipline. And that then you have to sort of um, leave emulation aside in order to do repro- repro- blah, blah, reproducibility, right? And and that's also, uh, that would be where I saw sort of a, a little shift maybe. Um, but yeah, so um, what would you think in terms of uh, periphery collections and peripheral collections? What is the tension between the national justification? Uh, because there's a, there's, a, there's a very specific sort of political background of identity and, and, and Um, actually contested identity the whole time. And you mentioned a, a couple of examples, a couple of, 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 of cases when, when that happened. Not only just this, this dependency, in, uh, in contrary to independence, this dependency with Austria and Vienna, um, but also with, with the rest of, uh, in the beginning, with the, with the rest of the Ottoman Empire, etc. So um, how, this, how would we describe, or would you describe rather, um, Serbian national science in this sort of development that you can see here of uh, an elite, but also these structures, this sort of burgeoning structures and, and institutions? In terms of this yeah. tension, no, between uh, centers and peripheries, and what is yeah, the, yeah. yeah this underdog feeling, and then the emulation of the Paris and 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 those sort of centers of calculation as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I, um, I, I, I kind of like trying to figure out where to start. For example, uh, they they uh they were had this kind of fully awareness that they were a periphery and uh they they uh i, I frequently made parallels with how the uh, how science worked in the colonies because even though serbia was not a colonized country uh it had this kind of like sense of like colonial periphery that doesn't have active participation in the production of knowledge and as i mentioned like uh, Austrian and Hungarian scholars passed through Serbia several times in this period between 1830s and the uh, 1890s, and uh, and you know in Serbia nobody really cared that much about that. But in the 1890s, when when Jurovic actually uh, becomes more and more um, how to say asserted as a scholar, mm-hmm. and um, at least in Serbia, it's, it, himself becomes recognized as a professor as someone of, of importance. Uh, he himself and then his students afterwards started doing the same, uh, started urging uh, Serbian authorities to forbid uh, uh, foreign scholars, uh, Austrian scholars to do any surveys in Serbia. We mm-hmm. don't need Austrians anymore. We can do it ourselves now. It mm-hmm. became a matter of pride. And, and this was a kind of very, uh, um, how to say, very blatant example of how this kind of like nationalism was combined with scientific uh, pride of that we can mm. do our own science like do not allow the austrians yeah. to do the service we can do it ourselves but uh for example at the same time had a they had a big problems with bulgarians right in the neighborhood 
because, for example, uh, uh, Zlatarsky, the chief geologist in, uh, in Bulgaria, didn't have any problems with the Austrians. He was regularly greeting them and conducting surveys with them together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for example, uh, uh, and this is, there, there was a sharp contrast that uh, after 1880s and 1890s, for example, Bulgaria was very well researched and very well traversed by all ge uh, geologists, including Serbians, uh, mm -hmm. scholars too. Even Serbian scholars uh, did explorations in Bulgaria, Austrians, Germans, everyone passed through. And Zlatarsky, Zlatarsky was welcoming everyone and publishing and collaborating on all kinds of projects. And for example, if you read, for example, uh, uh, announcements in Serbian uh, geological journals, uh, they were kind of like, what's wrong with Zlatarsky? Why is he allowing them? You know, they're practically taking over his science, like they're uh -huh. doing the job instead of him and they're gaining reputation and like a Bulgarian uh, science will become stagnant because of this, because the, the center mm -hmm. will still remain in, in Bulgaria. And for me, it was a really uh, uh, stark contrast on how, how, why they perceived this as a problem. They, they kind of could, at the same time, they saw themselves on the equal par with, with, with the Bulgarian scholars. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they it's, saw it's that they strategy. should collaborate. They saw that they should collaborate, but at the same time, they thought that kind of like, you know, why as one uh, small school as Bulgarian was allowing the Austrians to do these surveys, we're not allowing them definitely. Mm -hmm. And every time, for example, and there were a couple of, uh, for example, congresses where uh, the foreign scholars would come to Belgrade, they would organize exhibition and um, um, expeditions, expedition, like they would organize a tour to mm -hmm. see some of the most significant locations on Danube, like where there were like some uh, uh, rock formations that were highly visible, for example, from the river. And every time, like, you know, something like that happens and Austrians publish what they saw and immediately in Serbia, they have a problem. Like, why did Austrians publish something like that? Yeah. And, you know, yeah. uh, there, there, were, there were a lot of issues and uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, I am, I'm, told you so now we we have to we have to unfortunately we have to stop but this this would this would turn into a great pub conversation after the seminar uh were, were we not uh all having it uh, online um but uh, thank you again dian uh for this great induction into uh this uh political background but also this growth and exponential growth of uh the earth sciences but also it's connection with territorial appropriation of a specific land and a specific landscape and how natural sciences and collection based sciences um, uh, have always this uh, highly political uh, tension uh, in them. Um, so I will uh, stop uh, the seminar now. Don't go anywhere, Diane. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Teodora, for your question. I hope there'll be in the next following days more uh, people that can uh, visualize this video and also make some comments. And I will um, make sure that uh, Diane gets your comments and your feedback. And thank you so much to everyone that was listening. And thank you, Diane, again. And th thanks, uh, thank you, uh, Katerina, and uh, thanks everyone for watching. Okay.